Let's continue solving for our Schwarzschild metric by computing the Ricci tensor components of that metric. We're then going to use those components to solve the Einstein field equations and end up with the solution for our Schwarzschild metric. Let's begin by recalling four things. The first is our Schwarzschild ansatz, our educated guess for the metric tensor solution to the Einstein field equations corresponding to a static, spherically symmetric mass. Note that b and a are exclusively functions of the radial coordinate r. Recall also from our previous video that after using the formulas we derived for the second kind Christoffel symbols corresponding to a diagonal metric tensor, this is what we got for the non-zero Christoffel symbols for the diagonal Schwarzschild ansatz. Note that the zero index represents the time coordinate, the one our radial coordinate, the two our theta coordinate, our angle relative to the positive x-axis, and the three our phi coordinate, our angle relative to the positive z-axis. The third thing to recall is also from a couple of videos ago that the Einstein field equations corresponding to Schwarzschild geometry are simplified to the Ricci tensor components all equaling zero. These are the vacuum Einstein field equations, meaning no dark energy and no other sources of mass or energy in the space surrounding our spherical mass. I've used i and j as the indices on my Ricci tensor here instead of the conventional mu and nu, but it's still the same idea. The fourth thing to recall is that the Ricci tensor is basically a contraction of the rank 4 Raymond curvature tensor, whose components are calculated using the Christoffel symbols. Now, in terms of those second kind Christoffel symbols, the Ricci tensor components r sub ij are written with the first two terms being the derivatives of the Christoffel symbols with respect to the coordinates, and the second two terms being written as the difference of the product of the Christoffel symbols. Of course, I've written down this expression in terms of summations. You don't need to write it with summations, you can use Einstein notation to make it a little more concise, but I've used summations here to make things more clear for you. I haven't actually covered the intuitive meaning or even the formal definition of the Raymond curvature tensor or the Ricci tensor yet in my tensor calculus series, but for the purposes of this video it's sufficient to just know this formula instead of the rigorous meaning and intuition behind the Ricci tensor. Now just so you guys can follow along more easily and to prevent me from having to scroll up and down repeatedly, I'm going to pin these four facts to the left side and to the upper part of my board and just change what I'm doing in the middle so you can easily look at the facts that I've mentioned and reference them throughout the video. So now that we've found our second kind Christoffel symbols for the Schwarzschild ansatz, let's go ahead and calculate the Ricci tensor components. If you brute force your way into calculating all 16 Ricci tensor components, you'll be dealing with an algebraic dumpster fire, but it's a lot simpler than that. The Ricci tensor in this case is also a diagonal tensor, so all the off-diagonal components are identically zero, while the diagonal components are not identically zero. The diagonal components are still supposed to be zero because they need to satisfy the vacuum Einstein field equations, but they're not identically zero, meaning we won't just get zero if we calculate them using our Christoffel symbol formula. I'm going to state this fact without proof. If you really want to brute force your way into calculating the off-diagonal components of the Ricci tensor, you can, but for the purposes of finding our Schwarzschild solution, that's not really helpful, so I won't do it here. Let's start by calculating the zero, zero component of the Ricci tensor. If we plug in i as zero and j as zero, then this is what I'll have for my expression for the zero, zero Ricci tensor component based on my formula in fact number four. But we can actually simplify this significantly. If we look at our Christoffel symbols on the left, the only non-zero term in this first partial derivative occurs when k equals one. There is no other non-zero Christoffel symbol component like gamma zero, zero, zero or gamma two, zero, zero. The next partial derivative term is a partial with respect to t, and there's no t term in any of our Christoffel symbols, so this just goes away. The third term in our r00 equation is only non-zero when k equals 1, but when k equals 1, any value of m applies for the second Christoffel symbol, so we still have to sum over m from 0 to 3 here. And finally, in the fourth term, the only non-zero Christoffel symbol for k equals 0 is m equals 1. Similarly, for the same fourth term, the only non-zero Christoffel symbol for k equals 1 is when m equals 0. The other two values of k just give you a zero Christoffel symbol. So let's now rewrite our expression for r0,0 after we've used these simplifications. The first term just reduces to this, the second term is always zero, the third term reduces to this summation over m, and the fourth term reduces to the sum of these two terms. The rest of this is just plugging in the Christoffel symbols and mindlessly simplifying. 
Now this derivative term is really the derivative with respect to r of b prime over 2a. If we use the quotient rule, we get the derivative of b prime, so b double prime, times the denominator, so 2a, minus the derivative of the denominator times the numerator, divided by the denominator squared, so 4a squared. If we plug in the rest of the terms, this is what we get. Now, if we simplify further by combining terms with a common denominator, here's what we end up with, our simplified expression for the R00 component of the Ricci tensor. Again, capital A and capital B are exclusively functions of the radial coordinate R. Their primes denote derivatives with respect to R. But this Ricci tensor component, just like all the others, has to satisfy the vacuum Einstein field equation, so R00 must equal zero. If we then set this Ricci tensor component to zero, here's what we have. We can now multiply both sides of this equation by the common denominator for a squared br. If we do that, we get the following equation corresponding to the zero zero component of the Ricci tensor. I'll call this equation zero. The next thing we'll do is calculate the one one component of the Ricci tensor. If we plug in i equals one and j equals one, this is what our Ricci tensor formula becomes. And let's now make some simplifications. If we look at our Christoffel symbols on the left, the only non-zero term in this first partial derivative occurs when k equals 1. For the other partial derivative term, every term from k equals 0 to 3 is non-zero, so we have to keep everything for this term. For the third term, the only non-zero Christoffel symbol occurs when k equals 1. Again, every Christoffel symbol here from m equals 0 to 3 is non-zero, so we have to keep all of those. For the fourth term, you can simplify it by noting that if k and m are not the same, then the fourth term becomes zero. You can see this if you compare it to the non-zero Christoffel symbols we have available. For instance, if k were 1, then m can only be 1 because there's no second kind Christoffel symbol that's 113 or 112, for instance. Those are zero. So if we now take and apply all these simplifying facts, this is what we get for the R11 Ricci tensor component. These two derivative terms cancel out, by the way. Next, we'll evaluate the derivatives of these Christoffel symbol components with respect to x super 1 or with respect to r. We'll again use the quotient rule for the 0, 1, 0 Christoffel symbol and simple differentiation for the 2, 1, 2, and 3, 1, 3 symbols. We'll then plug in the rest of the symbols to get this expression. And finally, we'll simplify to end up with the following for the r11 component of the Ricci tensor. Just like before, this Ricci tensor component has to satisfy the vacuum Einstein field equations, so R11 must equal zero. If we then set this Ricci tensor component to zero, we can now multiply both sides of this equation by the common denominator for a b squared r. If we do that, we get the following equation corresponding to this R11 component. I'll call this equation one. Lastly, let's calculate the 2, 2 component of the Ricci tensor. If we plug in i equals 2 and j equals 2, here's what our Ricci tensor formula becomes, and now let's simplify. The first partial derivative is only non-zero when k is 1 or 3. Meanwhile, the next partial derivative term is always zero because none of our non-zero second kind Christoffel symbols contains a term in theta, and x super 2 represents the theta coordinate. For the third term of this Ricci tensor component, the k22 Christoffel symbol is only non-zero when k is either 1 or 3. And for the fourth term, the k equals 0 term is always 0. The k equals 1 term is only non-zero when m is 2. The k equals 2 term is only non-zero when m equals 1 or 3. And the k equals 3 term is only non-zero when m equals 2. If we now apply these simplifications, here's what we'll get. We're still left with this summation in the middle. The first term in the summation is non-zero for m going from 0 to 3, so we'll have to fully expand it out. The second term is only non-zero when m equals 2. We'll now plug in our Christoffel symbols. This first term, this partial derivative, is found once again by using the quotient rule, and it turns out to be the following. The second term, this partial derivative in phi, is found by using the product rule on negative sine phi cosine phi to end up with this. We'll then plug in the other Christoffel symbol terms to get the following. We'll cancel some like terms and simplify to finally get this equation for our R22 Ricci tensor component. Again, this has to equal zero based on the vacuum Einstein field equations. Now the sine squared phi term can't always be zero. This whole equation has to be valid for all locations in the space-time surrounding the spherical mass, so the only possibility is if the term in the brackets is always zero. We'll then multiply this equation using the term in the brackets by 2a squared b to get the following. And then I'll call this equation 2.
So in the end, we've got equations 0, 1, and 2 as our system of nonlinear coupled differential equations that arise from setting the Ricci tensor components to 0 in order to solve the vacuum Einstein field equations to get our Schwarzschild metric. These are really all the equations you need. And you might ask, well, what about the R33 component? Well, if you actually go through the algebra to calculate R33, you find that it's the exact same as R22, except R22 has an additional factor of sine squared phi, so it's kind of redundant. Now, in the next video, I'm going to solve the differential equations given by equation 0 to 2 to find AFR and BFR, and then eventually find the solution for our Schwarzschild metric. If you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.